Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord, for Pastor Toller and the Refuge family. We bless your name, Lord. We thank you for this place that's budding and bursting forth, shining kingdom light in this place, driving back the dark, the thick darkness, the encroaching darkness from the netherworld. But this light shines so bright, O oh God. And let it shine ever even so brightly that the forces of darkness in this region will feel a threat of the bright light that shines in this place. That in their dark places, we will see them in the spirit as if covering their eyes because the light from the refuge is so powerful. The glory is shining so brightly. And the forces of hell will be dismayed. They will be frustrated. Father, we give you praise tonight. You are indeed worthy of it all. From you are all things. You are the source of everything. Everything, Lord, can be traced back to you. It all flows from you. And to you are all things. You are the destiny of it all. It's all headed back to you. Came from you, going back to you. You are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And everything in between, they honor your sovereign rule tonight. Father, we do not want to go into this week, this, through this journey of time without you, like Moses, we said, Lord, we're not leaving this place unless you go with us. We need you, Lord. We need you. More than ever before, we need you. We need you to get out of bed. We need you to make it from the driveway and to the neighborhood street. We need you on the highway. We need you every step of the way. We do not want to journey through life this week on our own. We need your spirit. We need more than street smarts. We need divine wisdom to guide us. We need more than the self-help that we can muster up. We need the power of Holy Spirit to fill us. My friend, if you have ministered at all to anybody today or this week, then you have expanded fuel. You have dispensed of something. Virtue has gone out of you. And the reason we gather here tonight, for those of you that have come back, because you know that your tank needs just a little more fuel. If you have witnessed to one person last week or today, you have spent some fuel. And we've come for God to refill us, to replenish us, so that we can go out and do it all over again, to get into traffic and to spend some fuel, to minister. That is power will pour in and through us. How many of you here this week, you, you want for God to bring you into situations where you will be able to expense some divine resources? Amen. That's why he gave it to us. So that we can spend it. So that we can, we can let it flow. Because he's got more waiting for us. No use asking him to fill us with the Holy Spirit if we ain't going to do anything with it. If he's going to fill you, then you, we got to be ready for traffic. Get into traffic and expand some fuel. Let his power flow through us. So, Father, continue to fill us. Continue to 
fuel us, continue to work on us. And as we get back into the thick of things, starting even this evening, going into the busy week, that, Lord, we will, we will be full of the energy of the Holy Spirit. And we will not be the one to break down by the roadside because we ran out of fuel. But we will make it to the end of one more week and empty out whatever you've poured into us today. We'll be ready for more because we got work to do with it. Thank you, Father. So fill us now. Fill us with the fuel of the Holy Spirit. And then show us where to expand it. That you will, it will have maximum impact. Whether it will be just with one person or with, be with a group of people. But Lord, show us where you want us to spend holy energy this week. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Father, just touch us. We need healing. We are in therapy with you now. <laughs> A wonderful counselor. Worldly people are spending hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to find temporary calm and peace. But here we are. We have access to the Prince of Peace. And you're filling us with your peace. They have to pay for it. They have to, to wait in a sitting room for it. They have to wait and, and hear next. But here we are, every one of us, at the same time, can access the fountain of peace, the river of joy. Every one of us, at the same time, no need to wait in line, no need to form a line. Every one of us, we have access to you right now. Let your peace flow. Let the river flow into us, oh God. Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Yes, Lord. Let the healing waters flow in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just say with me, Lord, here am I. Fill me. Cleanse me. Fill me with peace. Fill me with love. Fill me with joy. Fill me with power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know about you, but I shudder to think how my week will go without worship. Uh, and I don't want to test, I don't want to test this, this thing out. What a week will be like without worship. Do you want to find out? I don't. I don't. It's like driving from here to wherever and you got no gasoline in the tank. You want to try it out? I don't. My week will be miserable without his presence. It will be. I, I wouldn't know exactly how to treat my wife. She'll get on my nerve. Actually, I get on hers before she gets on mine. I wouldn't know what to do with my 16-year-old. Worship is where we receive everything we need to live each day successfully for the Lord. You miss a week of worship and you will see the quality of your life go down real fast. Try it. Go a day without spending time before the Lord in the word or in prayer and then try to go out there and try to live the Christian life and see how that goes. Let's hear your story. I can tell you right now, 
It's not going to go very well. You'll be short-tempered. Lord have mercy. Oh, no. I shudder to think of it. Understanding God's kingdom culture, uh, God's law through kingdom culture. Matthew uh, 5, 21 to 32. Turn with me. We are in the Sermon on the Mount talking about kingdom culture. God has a culture. Amen. Just like we have a culture. And do you know what culture he wants us to live by? His culture. That's why he called us. That's why he saved us. I know that we appreciate our culture, but the whole work of God, sanctification, that whole process of sanctification, making us more like Christ, taking us from glory to glory. Another way to look at that is getting us to reflect more and more of his culture and less and less of ours. This is the journey. Uh, here in this text, the first thing we meet here is anger, danger. God's law condemns anger long before man's law condemns murder. And here in, in these verses, 21 through 26, Jesus is teaching us the true meaning of thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13, from the Ten Commandments. Jesus is saying here, this is what we, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had in mind when we gave the command on Sinai to Moses, to the Israelites, thou shalt not kill or you shall not murder. This is what we meant. Amen? Look at verse 21, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder or thou shalt not kill. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. If you kill somebody... You're going to have to go to court. And the law is going to condemn you. But I say to you, you see that? You see the king talking? That's what you heard, but you didn't get it. Because, see, when you heard that shall not kill, you heard don't take somebody's life. But Jesus said, before you got to that point, Heaven's court has already, has already judged you. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Racha, this was an Aramaic word, very strong word for empty headed, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool or idiot, shall be in danger of hellfire. Think about that. This is the standard of God's kingdom. He says, you anger with somebody enough that you wish they did not exist. The court of heaven says, murderer. You already killed the person. Before anybody called 911. There in my heart, before anybody saw anything manifest as to a plan or a weapon in my hand, he said, you're already murdered. You are angry and your anger is not righteous anger. How many of you know there's such a thing as righteous anger? Righteous anger is when people flout the the standards of God, and you are offended for, because of that. It's like Jesus going to the temple, and they're selling in there, ripping people off right there in the temple, in God's name. You bring your animal to sacrifice, they say, no, that animal is not holy. We got holy animal to sell you. So you sell your animal, you sell it to them for, for 10 bucks. And they sell you holy sheep for a hundred. And Jesus got very angry about that. Are you with me? 
And so there are things that should upset you, but remember, holy anger is never over personal offense. When people insulted Jesus, they looked at him and called him a son of fornication, meaning he was born out of wedlock. I know today that one day uh, is a big deal. Well, back in the day, that was a big deal. They looked at him and called him a son of fornication, meaning Mary had you before he got married to your dad. He didn't get upset over that. He did a miracle, and they, and, they, and they looked at him and said, you do miracles because you are operating under the influence of the prince of demons, Beelzebub. That didn't make Jesus mad because that would not be holy anger. When somebody curses your mama and you get mad, that's not holy anger. It doesn't matter how much you love your mama. Holy anger is when people are trampling over the things of God or people are taking advantage of somebody else and you rise up to stand up for the principle of God that says you got to protect that life, that's holy anger. And you never want to let go of that anger. But that other anger that we get because the light changed and somebody's sitting in front of us, they've been sitting for, for, for half a minute since the light changed and we're going crazy. Born in the name of Jesus. That kind of anger, Jesus said, you are in danger of the verdict of heaven's court. Do you know that that half a minute that that person did not go, maybe God is actually delaying you to miss the accident that would be just down the road? That that traffic light didn't change for so long and God is holding you back so that you would drive by an accident scene and it wouldn't be you in the accident? We get mad over things like that. You see, that kind of an anger, you're in danger of hellfire. The standard of God is high, very high. Long before the police is called, he has already said, you've broken God's law. Because the anger that you are harboring, this tit for tat anger, it has no place in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, we overcome evil with good. Meaning if somebody makes you mad, you fix them a cup of tea and see if they can deal with that. That's very different, right? It's very different from how we operate. Very different. Hmm. Now look at here. Jesus brings this home for people who want to be mad with somebody and still come to church and have a great time of worship. Read verse 23. For if you bring your gift to the altar, you come to worship, Symbolized by your offering and, uh, and, 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 and there remember that your brother has something against you. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember as I'm coming to worship and I'm bringing my offering and I remember that someone has something against me. Not me he has something against the person. This is how high this standard is. It doesn't say you remember you have something against him. No, you remember the person has something against you. Watch how he shocks us. If this doesn't shock you, I'm not sure you're reading it right. He said, you are in the moment of worship. You're about to raise your hand to worship to God. You're about to lift your song. You're worthy of it all. And there you remember that somebody has a grudge against you. There's an unresolved issue. Between you and anybody, it could be somebody you're married to, it could be a child, it, it could be a, a parent, it could be a neighbor, it doesn't matter, a co-worker, a classmate. But you know this person has something, and, 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 and that thought comes to, I wonder who's bringing that thought to your mind. Holy Spirit, 
He doesn't want any pretenders. So the Holy Spirit puts this on your mind. He said, this person has something against you and you have not reserved, you have not resolved that Jesus says, what, in verse 23, you remember that it has something against you, verse 24, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. If the person is in the same church with you, just stop singing, walk over to the chair the person is sitting on, and take care of it. Don't sing another line of the song. You can sing if you want, but it's noise at that point. God's not accepting that worship. Kingdom culture requires a pure heart, no pretenses. Do you know how difficult it is, Pastor Toller, to preach a sermon when you as a pastor, you and your wife, had a, one of those heated conversations that has not been resolved? I know what I'm talking about. And you come up, you're trying to preach. <laughs> and everybody has a way of knowing when the pastor and wife are not getting along. Or amen is at a different level, you know. <laughs> you say that. It's one of the most difficult things in ministry, trying to preach a sermon when you, the preacher, and your wife are not talking or talking nice. Don't preach the sermon. Find her. Find him. And say, dear, I can't preach this word. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Jesus is taking this thing so seriously. This is the way you do it. You stop everything. You, I thought Jesus, you would say, okay, wait, right after church found said, No, 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 stop. And go find them. And deal with it. Okay? Deal with it. Kingdom culture, I'm telling you, this is radical. Agree with your adversary quickly. Watch you on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. As surely I said to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And he's illustrating here. This is as serious as having a falling out with somebody that's going to sue you, and you don't deal with it. And the person goes and sue you, and you pay everything you have. Jesus says it's going to be worse for you than that. If you were to force the issue and worship anyway without resolving the thing between you and somebody. How is it that some Christians can hold a grudge for 30 years with a family member? And serve the Lord and worship and teach Bible study. And, and lead children ministry. 30 years. Yes, you're doing your own thing then. You're doing your own thing. There have been so many wasted worship, and you think you were worshiping those 30 years, and none of it, none of it got past the ceiling. None of it. Zero percent of it. Because there was a heart condition there that the kingdom of God said, that can be there for you to worship me. Because Jesus dealt with this in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. And if I had that grudge there, or that person had that grudge against me, I have not dealt with it. That heart is not pure enough for worship to sip through. See, so the worship is not getting through. So it doesn't matter if it's your teenager. 
you're going to ask for forgiveness before you sing one more line, before you teach one more Bible study. Hmm. I don't know about you, but this thing has a way of humbling me. They say, God, if this is the standard, I stand no chance. Welcome to grace. Hallelujah. Okay, let's advance this thing. It's been there long enough. Help me out. Where's my, where's my guy? I want this. I, the next one is it, it's not talking to me. Can you make it go? Ah, yeah. <laughs> point it there or point it? I don't know where to point it. Okay, I just, I just wanted to go. Verse 27. Verse 27. Um, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now he's dealing with sexual sin. So this thing about anger, that's all of the emotional things that we deal with. He said emotionally, you have to work things out with people. For worship, for your worship to be acceptable to God. Amen? Now he's going into sexual sins. Thank you, sir. Um, it went too far, yeah. Okay, right here. The lustful look. Lust is what? Sexual sin in seed form. But it's there. It's there. It's in seed form. This is the true meaning of thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus 20, 14, interpreted by our Lord Jesus Christ, verses 27 through uh, 30. Heard that it was say you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, this is what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this is what we meant when we gave, it, gave you the law on Mount Sinai, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her uh, uh, has already committed adultery with her, not in his bed, in his heart. Somebody say, ouch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Now Jesus makes some of the most drastic statements he ever made in his life. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, meaning to commit sexual sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. He said, well, I'm going to have one eye. He said, it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish or body parts perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Wow. So now he wants us to mutilate ourselves. He is making a point that when it comes to sexual sin, never, never overlook it. Don't overlook this thing. It can wreck your life. You and I know the stories. Mighty men of God and women of God. Great ministries, global ministries. And one encounter. And how the mighty have fallen. Because somebody overlooked something. And in our day and time, the opportunities are, opportunities are even more. A little website here on that Facebook. If somebody keeps showing up and they're wearing beach clothes, switch them off. If their picture is showing up on your screen and they are in, what you call it, bikini? Bikini. Huh? Is that it? Yeah. Switch it off. He said, you got to cut it off. And if you can't keep your hand to yourself, he said, better cut it off. This is drastic stuff. You know, there are some guys that they think it is their assignment 
to behold the beauty of the Lord in another woman. I can't help it. She's just pretty. Jesus said, poke your eye and be thinking about that. And you will forget about the pretty woman that just walked by. And then there's some guys, they just can't help it. They think they, their assignment is to hug every, every woman. I'm just a hugger. Dude, that's just a cover for lust. You like the feeling you get when you're hugging these women. I don't mean to mess up church. But not everybody in church is giving a holy hug. Some of these people are doing a little more than giving a holy hug. We need to help one another out in church. Let's help each other out how we dress. Jesus here, Jesus it's scientifically accurate. He focuses on the men. Men are visual beasts. And the women in this culture have forgotten that. They think they can expose whatever they expose. And, and, and it's always on the men. Ladies, we need your help. These eyeballs. Why do you think there is not a magazine called Playgirl? Because men are visually driven. So there's a Playboy magazine because when he sees that image, he's going hunting. And he can be lying next to his woman in bed and that image is in his head. And he's fantasizing. Sleeping with one, fantasizing about sleeping with the other. Jesus says, you committed adultery already. I know what I'm talking about. Because this was a stronghold in my life, I tell you. It was a stronghold in my life. And after I got married, it kept coming after me. I had an uncle in the military that introduced me to pornography. He came to this country, came to Georgia, Fort Benin, came to military school, and he went back and he thought some of the most precious thing you could have gotten from, from America was pornographic videos. And I went to spend time with him on a vacation and stumbled onto that thing. And he was out of the house and I started playing tapes. And those images burned themselves into my teenage mind. For years after I got saved, I could not shake it off. I had to fast and pray for days for God to help me bury, bury that dirt. Jesus knew what he was talking about. He said, don't, don't give it a daylight. When it shows up, deal with it, right? Be drastic. Cut off the internet if you have to. Cancel, cancel the, the thing if you have to. But don't let this seed germinate. It's going to destroy you. You'll be better off one-handed in heaven. And you let this thing fester and eat up your life and undermine your Christian life and take away your credibility. And you're sitting in church and you can't focus because those images keep burning themselves. know what I'm talking about. This thing will drag you down. Doesn't know I will be staying in the pulpit and my mind is into them things. Those videos. And you know how the devil works with this? Can I tell you a story? What time is it? Um, <laughs> How many of you know the devil goes to seminary too? Yeah. Did you know that? Yes. That he's enrolled in, in Bible college? <laughs> we are in seminary, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. This is the flagship seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. They are proud of it. 
it is the crown jewel, okay? Sits on Lexington Road in Louisville, Kentucky. I was in that school from 1991 to 1993. I left in the summer of 92 to go to Ghana to get married to my wife. And uh, I got stranded there. Lost my travel documents. And the embassy did not renew it. So I was stranded there. Some of you read my story. Refugee was my name in the, in the book there. Finally came back after 11 months to resume school. When I came back, I went to look at my mailbox. I thought it was still mine after 11 months. I had no clue. And so I went to see what mail I had collected during those 11 months. I went to my seminary mailbox. Guess what I found? Playboy magazines. A load of them. A stack of them. My mailbox had been reassigned to another seminary student studying for the ministry that was subscribed to Playboy magazine. And so I took up the issue with the people in charge of the mail at the seminary. I said, there's Playboy magazine in my mailbox. They say it's no longer your mailbox. And so I was just curious to say, but the person that belongs to, is that a student here? Yeah. Southern Baptist one of the most conservative denominations in the world. If at their flagship seminary, you got subscribers to Playboy magazine, my friend, the devil knows that sexual sin is an effective weapon in the kingdom of darkness. And he will wield it and wield it and wield it because it works for him. That's how we have youth ministers molesting little girls and little boys in our churches for years. And finally, some of these churches are getting sued and they are settling out of, out of court. The right eye offend you, pluck it out. He's saying, be drastic when it comes to sexual temptations. Be very drastic. If you think going to that concert is going to bring you in a situation where you're going to be tempted, let the $30 go. Stay home. Better for you to be out of 30 bucks than to go out there and expose yourself. <laughs> there are people who think that Jesus, well, Jesus was here. He didn't say anything against homosexuality. Here's what people don't, ignorant people don't know. The word for adultery is a catch-all word for all things sexually immoral. Adultery is not just a married person sleeping with somebody else. It is, in fact, another word that captures the same thing is the word fornication. In the Greek Bible, it's poneros. We, it's the word we get, the word pornography. It's a catch a term for any kind of sexual uh, relationship that's outside of God's norm of a sexual relationship between one man and one woman at one time. Anything outside of that is adultery and it's fornication. So we said Jesus did not address homosexuality. He did. He didn't use the word, but he uses this word. He took it seriously. Amen. And then finally, for tonight, limited divorce. God's standard for marriage does not condone no fault divorce. <laughs> Okay, let, let, let's read the text here. And here Jesus is interpreting Deuteronomy 24, 
1 through 4, that talks about this certificate of divorce. Okay? Matthew 5, 31 to 32. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reasons except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever uh, marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. This is the Jesus that many people are not listening to today. People have a one-sided Jesus. How many of you know that's true? They got the grace Jesus, but the truth Jesus is like they miss that Jesus. This is a tough saying. This is a very tough saying. This is not easy. You got to look at it carefully. Okay? If I divorce my wife for any reason except sexual immorality, she slept with someone else or I slept with someone else, or I'm so hooked on pornography that she can't deal with it, except for that reason. And if we divorce, then we ought to remain unmarried till we die. Because if, if any of us is remarried and we divorce not because of sexual immorality, then in God's eyes, we're still married. Okay? Jesus said that. That's not Moses. That's Jesus. And that's tough. Okay? Some of the people think that Moses kind of was really way up here with the law and Jesus brought it down. Uh-uh. Jesus didn't come to lower the bar. He said, no. I raised it to where you don't stand a chance. Okay? So this is hard. Uh, but no fault divorce. How many of you know the history of no fault divorce in America? You know where it started? You can guess the state. It's where all things downhill starts in America. California. Do you know who was governor when no fault divorce started in California in the 70s? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. He signed the law. Up to that point, if you want to divorce somebody, you have to prove. You got to have, give a reason for the divorce. And it had to be valid in the eyes of the court. The legislature passed a law that you could divorce for any reason. You didn't have to come up with a reason. For any reason or for no reason, it's called no fault divorce. And it became the law of the land and it swept across the country. And now all 50 states have no fault divorce. Jesus said, that's wrong. If you're going to divorce, you got to have grounds for divorce that is acceptable or approved by God. Are you with me? No for divorce is not kingdom culture. And by the way, these, the, the Pharisees, uh, they were ridiculous. You know, if you read history and some of the things that they said you could divorce your wife for, if she stood in front of the house and she talked loud enough for the neighbor to hear her, that was ground for divorce. If she cooked the food and it was too brown, we call it burn the food. Ground for divorce. You see the guy working up a certificate. Honey, what are you doing? I'm about to divorce you. What did I do? Burn the food. Burn the food. I mean, they had a long list of things that the man could write a certificate of divorce for. And the women could not write it. And this whole thing about the certificate of divorce when Moses gave it in, in Deuteronomy 24 was to protect the woman. So that when the guy kicked her out, she would have this piece of paper that if you were to change his mind and say, you know what, we're still married. He said, uh-uh. She could say, uh-uh, here's the paper. It was to protect the woman. And the Pharisees took it and they abused it. And there was no limit to what you could write a, a bill of divorce for. Jesus comes and he says, no, there has to be limit. Divorce has to be very difficult. Not easy. 
no need in kingdom culture. We don't write prenuptial. Gonna write this deal that, well, if this thing doesn't work out, and, and then uh, let's see what's gonna happen if it doesn't work out. That's not kingdom. Prenuptial. You heard of that, right? It doesn't work out. I get this, you get that, I get the other. And you go into marriage as we're just holding it. Now, if you look at the whole Bible, okay, including New Testament, Old New Testament, we find at least three grounds for divorce. How many of you know this is very limiting? Very limiting. Just three, okay? Here they are. What's the first one? Adultery. Again, sexual infidelity of any kind. You're in a relationship with this person you're married to, and they sleep with somebody else, or they are into pornography, or, uh, uh, I mean, any kind of deviant sexual behavior outside of God's order, that's ground for divorce. That's sexual immorality. It covers all of that stuff. Now, it doesn't mean you, you have to divorce the person, but it said if you want to divorce the person, God's court approves that. Am I clear about that? I mean, we, we've met people, I've worked with, with, with couples in marriage counseling where uh, one has forgiven the other for adultery. So it doesn't say you have to divorce, but it said it's a ground for divorce from the mouth of Jesus. Second ground for divorce is what we call what? Abandonment. By the way, they all start with A. And this, we get this from... Paul, this little statement he makes in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, if the unbelievers depart, let him depart. This is two, these are two people that were non-believers and, and they got married while they did not know Christ and then one of them comes to know Christ. This is the picture here. Not two Christians from the start. But two unbelievers, they got married. One of them became a believer and then the unbeliever said, this is not what I signed up for. I'm out of here. Paul says, in that situation, the believing person can get married again. Are you following me there? Okay. You get married again. You cannot force a person to remain married to you. Uh, but, you know, they're out of there. They, they are the unbeliever. They go, you get married again. So that's ground for divorce. Abandonment. person just walks out. They ain't coming back. And then the third, we infer this one. This is by inference, Okay. But I think we are on good ground here. Uh, physical violence. What kind of violence? The reason it's important for us to underline that is that if we just say violence, you know how sneaky this culture is, right? We will get into emotional abuse, mental abuse. Now, I'm not saying these are not real things. But I'm telling you, when we go down that rabbit hole, we are in deep waters then. Because, I mean, all you have to do to, to abuse some people emotionally is get up and frown at them first thing in the morning, and that's emotional trauma. They can divorce you out of that. See the way he looked at me? He looked at me like he never looked at me before, but when he looked at me, I saw the devil in his eye. That's ground for divorce. No, physical, physical violence, okay? And we infer this from Ephesians 5, 25 to 29, that it said, husbands, you ought to love your wife like Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, and, and, and he nourishes the church. If you love your body, you love the, the, your wife like you love your body, you cherish, you nourish, you take care of the body. Well, what's the opposite of that? Beating up your body. Hitting your body in the nose, giving your body a black eye, okay? And so I think we are, in, we are on firm biblical ground here when we say when you find a couple, especially if you're a pastor or somebody in ministry or a leader in the church, and you find a couple and you have proof that somebody in that relationship is physically hitting someone, and that person say, I don't feel safe in this relationship. I want to get out of here I, with me. I told them, you should. I have to see proof, but yes, you should. 
I cancel a, a couple one time, and 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 this was the situation. Um, everything started fine, you know, when they met, and then uh, it got to a place that God was just so possessive, and he had to do things that would scare the woman so that she would not even consider cheating on him. And she got so scared, she started to take pictures. And she brought some of these pictures, and he tried to deny it. I was counseling with him. And she pulled out. He, he didn't know she'd been keeping these pictures. And she showed me some of those pictures. And I asked him, is that you? So yeah. In one of those pictures, he was so mad at her that to show that he, what he could do to her, he punched this big hole into the wall. Yeah, I mean, that was a big hole right there. I said, dude, is, is, that, is, that, is that your hand there? I said, yeah. And he was trying to justify that. I said, man, unless you deal with that, she has no reason to remain married to you. If you punch this woman like that, she's either dead or unconscious. What kind of love is that? The bigger point here is, if in your marriage, you got none of these on a kingdom culture. You have no grounds for divorce. Now, I know how, how the devil can play this. You know, in some of us Christian people, they say, oh, I could rather make you miserable as long as I don't do one of those. You can't get rid of me, can you? See, that's how, that's how, that's how sneaky, you know, that, that the human mind is. I hope we don't think that. Let's make it easy to remain in marriage. Marriage is a good thing. It's one of the things the kingdom of God has going for it. And if we, if we keep losing marriages at the rate we are, the kingdom of God is going to be grossly on our mind. And we're going to lose so much credibility. It's going to be hard for us to preach the gospel. Marriage is a big part of preaching the gospel. Because you see the relationship we're bringing, that we're, we're telling people to come into Jesus, to, to, to come in, into with Jesus, it resembles the relationship between man and wife. Remember that. And if we don't have that, that covenant relationship, and if it doesn't matter to us anymore, it's going to be hard inviting people to Jesus. What are we inviting them to? What kind of a relationship? The relationship is that of marriage where he's the groom and we are the bride. It is part of our evangelism. Marriage is. So let's make it hard to divorce. So take away. Let's read with me. A citizen of God's kingdom values every person's dignity. So we don't call people names. Rah, fool. No. People are dignified. Read with me. God's kingdom citizen takes initiative to heal broken relationships. Be, regardless of what the other person does, if you are a kingdom citizen, even if you know if the other person is a Christian, I still take initiative to heal that relationship. Doesn't matter what caused the problem. Amen? No grudges. No grudges. In fact, do you know what the expiration uh, 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 is on on, on, on anger for the, for the kingdom citizen, 24 hours. 
Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's it. And especially for married people. Um, keeping speech for days, that's not kingdom. 24 hours is all you got. If you haven't worked it out in 24 hours, get over it. Because the Bible says if you keep holding on to it, all you're doing is come in, devil, come into our house, come into our relationship. Just opening the door to the devil. Let's read with me. The disciple of Jesus cannot afford to be careless about sex drive. They call it sex drive for a reason. It drive you to a lot of places. Some places you don't want to go. And they just ticks you. Gets onto cruise control. It ticks off. Sex drive. That's a ride you don't want. Jesus wants his disciples to treat marriage as a lifelong relationship between a heterosexual. And in our day and time, heterosexual couple, did you hear me? Online, did you hear me? Heterosexual people. There's going to be a day when a preacher talks like that, he'll be headed straight to jail. Isn't that a wonderful way to make the news? Some of us have been waiting for our life to be famous. This is our ticket. Just talk about sex is between a man and a woman in marriage. And they put the handcuffs on. Famous preacher. Famous Christian. But that's it. Will you stand with me? My friend. Pastor Tolo, if you don't mind, very quickly. Is there anybody here? God's been speaking to you. Especially this matter of the sex drive. It's more powerful than you want it to be in your life. Somebody decides what you look, what you look at or how long you look at it. And God is saying to you, that's a deadly snake that you've been petting, tonight, we kill it. And if you hear you want to do that, I'm telling you, this is a big problem in our churches. We got a lot of men in our churches hooked on pornography, on all kinds of websites. It's easy now. That's a pet snake. I know what I'm talking about, this thing. This thing tormented me for years while I was a preacher. And my wife knows the whole story. And one time, I think it was in 2012, that's how recent it was. It was nine years ago before she had to help me and ask her to help me to deal with it. It was through fasting and prayer took that long. I got saved in 1982. Think about it. Do the math. Until 2012. And I'm the pastor of a church. And I've been pastor of several churches. This stuff is real. So you heard my dirt. It's in the open now. Not just here, but online, whoever else will see it. You got to deal with this stuff. So if you're here and this thing is an issue, come to this altar and let's kill the snake here tonight. Anybody? Anybody? Kill the snake here. Don't pet it anymore. Don't play with it. It could mess up things that are valuable to you. Put it to death tonight. Put it to death. Leave it here at the altar. It's a snake. We cut the head off. Father, in the name of Jesus, you talk to God about this. I can't do it for you. 
I help you, but you had to talk to God about this. This part of my life, I kill it tonight with the power of your spirit. I give it to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. I cut the head of this snake, this demonic thing that seeks to undermine my marriage and my vital relationship. I cut it out in Jesus' name. That even at times when I'm looking at my Bible, the images are coming. When I'm worshiping, the images are coming at these just unforeseen times. Here comes that image again. I cut it out tonight in Jesus' name. Tonight. In the name of Jesus. Take authority over it. Nail it to the cross. I nail it to the cross. I crucify it. I modify it by the power of Jesus. I nail it there. Nail it there. And I leave all the guilt and the condemnation there on the cross. This thing is behind me. I'm cutting it out. I'm poking it out tonight. I'm not playing with it. I'm not nursing it. I'm getting rid of it. I cast it far from me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And let me just say one more thing, brothers. The thing that did it in my life was fasting and prayer. And I took time. It was several days. I'm telling you, some demons don't die easy. You heard that movie, Die Hard? The sex demon is the die hard kind. Took me several days of fasting and prayer. So if you still struggle with this beyond tonight, I advise you to use fasting as a weapon against the overactive sex drive. Let go of food and deal with this. And don't leave until... You know with God that the power has been broken over your life. It was nine years ago for me. And I could not talk like this for all those years. Pastor Tuller.